not unconditionally good. So we have to ask now, what's the relationship between um, a good will and a good end? This is sort of the heart of content. What's the relationship between a good will and a good end? So are ends or goals made good by willing properly? Or do we determine whether somebody is willing properly by looking to see if they're aiming at good ends? Um, the second point, the second way, say that a good end, first comes a good end, a good goal, and there, and then we decide whether a will is good by determining whether we aim at that. That really is the sort of natural and more obvious way to think about it. Um, so we might think that first what we have to do is identify what goals are worth pursuing. And then we say that a will is a good one, a person is a good one, when they aim at those proper ends. But Kant rejects that. That's what I've just been talking about. A will is not made good simply by aiming at good ends. And there are two reasons for this. One is what we've just been talking about. It has to will good ends for the right reason. Um, we've seen this several times now, that a person is not necessarily a virtuous person simply if they have the proper ends. They have to have the proper ends for the proper reasons. So a person, a will, is not a good one simply in virtue of aiming at the proper ends. It has to have the right maximum at the proper ends for the right reasons, with the right incentives. Is that clear? Okay, but there's another reason also. Um, what makes an end good, what makes a possible object of the will or a state of affairs of the world good? Well, remember that for Kant, no ends, no objects of the will, no states of affairs of the world are unconditionally good. That's how part one started, by examining all these things which are conditionally good, but not always good. We can always find circumstances in which some end is in fact not good. And what's the condition that makes those states of affairs good? Part one, very beginning. Lots of things are conditionally good. But they're not unconditionally good. There's only one thing that's unconditionally good. That's a good will. What's the condition that makes those sometimes good things actually good? They're, they are the ends of, they're attached to a good will in the proper way. So when a will properly aims at them, then they are good. So ends are not intrinsically good. States of affairs of the world are not intrinsically good. These things are not always. And in fact, the condition that makes them good is that they are willed by one of these. So the condition ends are conditionally good, and the condition is precisely that they are willed by a good will. So an end, so an end, that is a possible object of the will, a goal that we might have is made good by being willed by a good will. So the sort of order of explanation goes that way. 
first we have to identify what's a good will, and then we can figure out what ends or states and affairs of the world are, in fact, good. So, I say that exactly the same words again. First, we have to determine what makes a will good. And only then can we figure out what states and affairs of the world are good. And in order to figure out when a will is good, we need to figure out when a maxim is good. Because a good will acts on proper maxims, on good maxims, on the right maxims. And it can't be that we can identify the good maxims simply by saying they aim at the good ends. So that's where we are. And our question then is, what makes a maxim? Oh, I was going to say, can't a bad will also will a good, a good end? Yes. So what, but you just said that what makes an end good is that it's built by a good will. But that's right. So what makes it like other ends makes it end good because bad wills can still grow good ends. That's right. Um, so a bad will, somebody who acts on a bad maxim, may in fact aim at an end that is good. Our question is what makes that end good? And the answer, well, the answer is Somehow it's related to a good will and a good maxim. So in other words, there can be uh, a contingent overlap between the end that a bad will has and the end that a good will has. The maxims had better be different in those two cases, even though the end of both maxims is the same. So what's the difference going to be? So remember, the end is incorporated into the maxim. And in this case, we have a bad maxim and a good maxim with the same end. There's better be something <coughs> different about those maxims, though. What else is there? The incentive. The reason why that end is taken to be good. So the bad will takes that end to be good for some reason. The good will takes that in to be good for some reason. And the difference is the reason, what Kant calls the incentives. Yeah, um, another question. So is that like a most typical? It looks that way. It sure does, right? So how, so how can we determine what a good will consists in without first knowing what it should be aiming at? Looks like it's hopeless. Looks like we're not going to be able to determine what makes a maxim good unless we first are able to identify what it should be aiming at. And also have something about the right reasons. Yes? Yeah? Okay. So are all good and basic reasons. Um, whether all of the maxim. So to determine whether a maxim is good, we have to take into consideration both the end and the incentive. You said that the will determines whether the end is good. Whether the end is good determines whether the maximum right. is good. Um, the will determines, right. So uh, a will determines whether the end is good uh, if it's a good will. Yeah, well, a good will determines whether it's But a good will can, a good will will only act on good maxims. So we have to figure out which of those are. We only act on a good maxim, and maxims are only good based on the reasons. So the end is maxims are not based, are good based only on the incentive. They're good on the combination of the incentive and the end. Well, it's like a whole bunch of just the additionals. It seems that way. Right. Like <laughs> good end, and then you right. Like whether maxims are good based on the end. So you, 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 at this point, you properly feel confused. That's the right feeling to have right now. It looks like there's no way of determining whether a maxim is good, except, well, except whether somehow, I mean, so what are the, our elements here? We have somehow whether 
it's the good end, something about the incentive, something about how they interact, something about the will actually acting on them. Okay. So here's our problem now. What makes a maxim good? And another way of making the point that I just made, that we were just talking about, that there's no state of affairs, no object that's intrinsically good. Um, another way of making that point is to say that there's no single end, in the sense of the state of affairs to be achieved, that all of the good maxims <coughs> So I want to try to explain more than that. If there were, so if there were some end, some state of affairs that all good maxims aim at, Kant thinks that a good will would be good only because it's promoting that good end. So Kant does not think this. But if he, but what he thinks is this. If there were some state of affairs of the world, some end, that all morally good actions were directed toward, then a good will would be valuable only because it's promoting those good ends. That's what would make it a good will. And in that case, a good will would only be good conditional. A good will would be good only instrumental to the extent that actually it was promoting the, that intrinsically good state of affairs. So for example, utilitarianism has exactly the structure. Utilitarianism says that an action is morally good to the degree that it produces happiness. And so here we have a goal that is taken to be intrinsically good against which we can assess whether a will is a good one or not. It's going to be good if it promotes that. It's going to be bad if it fails to promote that. So a will would be good on a utilitarian view to the extent that it's producing overall happiness. But this is not something that's determined strictly by the will itself. It depends on circumstances. Also, so the extent to which a person actually succeeds in promoting happiness is not something that we can determine simply by looking at the person alone. Right? As we um, cast our actions out into the world, sometimes they succeed, sometimes they fail. Um, and on this kind of view, we would have to say that person is a good person to the extent that they actually succeed in promoting uh, this good end. But that's not entirely up to them. The world might not cooperate with them. Okay, so, and, and, and Kant wants to say, a good person really is unconditionally good. So there can't be some end, some state of affairs, that all good actions are aiming to promote, or else they will be only conditional, dependent on circumstances. So Kant is denying that there is such an end. Such, there, Kant is denying that there is such an end toward which all moral action is directed. He's denying that there is some pre-moral state of affairs that all moral actions aim to maximize. He's rejected a teleological view. Kant's view really is deontological in the sense that uh, I've talked about. So we cannot, for Kant, we cannot start our project by a, a moral philosophy by identifying what